welcome to the most recent talk from Ormskirken District Family History Society. This month we've decided to talk about the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 to 1919. This is a topic which I'm particularly excited to cover because the whole idea was suggested by one of our members and we do love getting feedback from our members. Between 1918 and 1919 over 50 million people across the globe died during this flu pandemic. First recorded in Spain, and maybe that is why we know it today as the Spanish flu. But it was known by different names in different countries. To the British troops who were serving in World War I, it was the Flanders Grip, or sometimes the Spanish Lady. In Spain, they actually called it the Naples Soldier, while in Germany, it was simply Blitzkatar. And from what I've been able to establish, approximately one in four British people were affected by the pandemic. Young adults were particularly susceptible, it appears, and by all accounts, the deaths that this illness caused were short, sharp, horrible ways to go. In fact, the website historicuk.com sums it up very well by saying that those fine and healthy at breakfast could be dead by tea time. It was that quick. And it wasn't unusual where you survived for a little longer for the symptoms to rapidly turn into pneumonia effectively people could suffocate and that is what killed them. So what I've decided to do for this talk is take that idea from our member who suggested the Spanish flu and I'm going to look at it in terms of how it affected the Ormskirk area. Of course it broke out in the final months of World War One, so that's probably a good way to start to look at how things were in and around Ormskirk in terms of medical facilities in that period. Now, I said before that many young people were affected by the Spanish flu and we know of course there were so many young soldiers who lost their lives in the First World War as well, right before the pandemic. So it's just as well perhaps that we can turn the clock back now to the year 1896 when those young soldiers and many of those who did die in the pandemic would have been babies, small children, perhaps not even born yet. We're going back to the year 1896. And on the 23rd of January that year, the Liverpool Mercury reported on the opening of Ormskirk's Cottage Hospital. As long ago as 1880, the committee of the Ormskirk Dispensary began to conceive the idea of advocating the building of a hospital. Rather a long-winded way of getting around to the topic. Hitherto, serious accident cases either had to be dealt with in the homes of the patients or had to be sent on to Liverpool which is a long way to go. On the opening of this new hospital, this will no longer be necessary as Ormskirk possesses a hospital of its size second to none in Lancashire and possessing everything in the way of sanitation, ventilation and convenience generally that modern medical science could wish for. That makes Ormskirk Cottage Hospital sound pretty state of the art, I think. The newspaper actually said that it cost between £1,150 to build and it was on the 22nd of January, the day before the article was published, that Lady Derby opened it. And all the local great and good were there for this grand opening, amongst them Sir Arthur Bower Forward, who was the first baronet, uh, also MP for Ormskirk at that time and his second wife, uh, Lady Forward. So Ormskirk is all set up for medical problems now. 
So let's move forward 18 years, Christmas 1914. The Liverpool Daily Post paints a very rosy picture of how the young wounded soldier patients celebrated Christmas at the cottage hospital. Each one hung up his stocking and long before daybreak they had risen to see what Santa Claus had brought them. There was a Christmas card from the King and Queen and also a box of chocolates from Messrs Cabria for each soldier and member of the staff. Turkey, plum pudding, fruit and sweets from the people of Ormskirk and the staff gave a concert in the evening. I wouldn't mind a Christmas like that. You think how young some of those soldiers were, they must have loved it. In addition to which, there was another hospital in Ormskirk, the isolation hospital on Green Lane, which was founded in 1894 and was sometimes known, unsurprisingly, as Green Lane Isolation Hospital. It does what it says on the tin. And that Christmas 1914, there were 31 young patients who had to stay in over the holiday period, but they did get a Christmas tree to enjoy, which is something. To quote from the late Mona Duggan's Ormskirk A History, during the years from 1917 until 1919, the children in the industrial school at Cross Hall were moved into a children's home and sent to different council schools while the school was used as a hospital, so the school was taken over for military purposes, effectively. And a further away still was Moss Side Hospital, specifically for epileptic patients in Muggle. It was brand new in 1914 when it was suddenly converted into a military hospital for more than 400 patients, so it's quite a sizeable building and 20 soldiers had arrived there for treatment in the first week of December 1914. The following Christmas there were 300 soldiers there so obviously the resources at Mughal were desperately needed. Eventually the facility had 500 beds which is enormous. But all this wartime healthcare activity leads us quite neatly into the time of the 1918-1919 pandemic. Now in this talk, I'm going to look at several different aspects of the flu, the pandemic. I'll look at the first hints of the outbreak in West Lancashire, the impact on education and leisure activities, tips that people were giving on hygiene measures and the mixed messages that you could find, whether people were treated at home or in hospital, whether there were any ways of self-treating and newspaper adverts for related cures and patent medicines that you might get in the chemist, reports of deaths and related obituaries. There will also be a case study using material very kindly provided by one of our members and finally I will look a little bit into the recovery period. When you begin to look into newspaper extracts and reports from the summer of 1918, it quickly becomes apparent that West Lancashire was certainly aware of this growing danger of flu, even at that early stage, even four or five months before the armistice. Notwithstanding all efforts to check it, the outbreak of Spanish influenza is apparently spreading. Reference to the fact that there was an outbreak of influenza in Bootle was made at the council yesterday when Dr R Turner, chairman of the health committee, stated that it was a very mild type and up to now there was no knowledge of any deaths directly due to influenza. There had been six deaths from pneumonia. It is officially stated that influenza cases in Southport are very few in number and slight in degree. A note that there have been 60 cases at Croston, mostly of a mild type. There has been one fatal case and we even know who that was. After an illness of a few days, Mr Thomas Hodson, fireman at the Jubilee Mill Croston, 
has died in his 54th year. Deceased was apparently taken with influenza, which developed into pneumonia. He leaves a widow and a one son. Now, by early August 1918, local cases of influenza were already starting to concern West Lancashire's Rural Council. Here we have some facts and figures from a report in the Ormskirk Advertiser published on the 15th of August 1918. And these next extracts might give you a clue about what happened next. Some of these measures are uncannily similar to what we're doing in 2020. It was absolutely clear that this flu outbreak was not just going to go away quietly. So something had to be done to try to control it. But what was that going to be in and around Ormskirk? Now one practice I hadn't seen mentioned at first was something that we are being very much encouraged to do now in 2020. Until I came across this letter in the Lancashire Evening Post from a traveller who had recently returned from Canada and wrote to the newspapers with their observations. Let's see what he or she said. All doctors, nurses and people visiting patients suffering from this so-called Spanish influenza should, before entering the house or hospital, don a mask which is made to cover the mouth and nose. It is a piece of medicated lint about four inches by six and secured by pieces of tape which fasten around the head. In Ottawa, where I was residing, the epidemic has been very severe and this precaution was found most effective. Upon leaving the house, the mask was burnt. Yours, etc. W. Saxon, Nucklands, Fullwood, December the 4th. So in 1918, they were using disposable masks. But were other hygiene measures being adopted? Dr. G. E. Schofield, Medical Officer to Ormskirk District Council, had visited the picture drums and advised the managers as to the measures that they should take. He had also visited the schools and he considered that it would be as well for the one in Derby Street and the one in Hans Lane to be closed until November the 11th, during which time they could be thoroughly disinfected. He also asked the council's sanction to have some leaflets printed, setting out precautions that might usefully be adopted by the public. And the front page of that edition was full of the usual adverts but the only cinema to make a point of their hygiene practices that they had introduced to combat infection was the Pavilion Theatre. 
During the influenza epidemic, this theatre is being disinfected daily. To comply with instructions received from the public health authorities, children under 14 will not be allowed admission during the epidemic. As for if you had a friend or a relative who was being treated at the Whittingham Asylum in Gooznar, Lancashire, tough. The managers put an advert in the Ormskirk papers to say that visitors were not allowed to come in. It was absolutely clear that a public health education campaign seemed to be a good idea. But what is really interesting is that the schools have been closed to be disinfected. But there was no really obvious suggestion that any large public gatherings, parties, that kind of thing, should be discouraged. There's nothing really about that kind of precaution. And in fact, there was a general election coming up at this exact same time in history. And six notices below the one banning the visitors at Whittingham Hospital, readers were told that at 6pm that very evening, <laughs> there would be an election meeting at the Corn Exchange in Ormskirk and the implication was that members of the public were welcome to attend. I will note however here that at the very same election in Sunderland in the North East candidates were specifically told not to go canvassing door to door so different rules in different areas. Very confusing. But that said people were being encouraged to do the right thing and to think of others and that applied as much to the managers of entertainment venues as it did to the patrons. In the difficult days that lie ahead of us, mutual consideration must be practised and all must conform to rules that make for the good of the majority. Young people find their pleasures in attending crowded gatherings such as picture palaces, small theatres, dancing halls, concert, lecture and club rooms. Unless these places are kept fresh by a current of air, germs are certain to lurk in them, ready to attack. And if you caught the flu? Well, patients who catch influenza must go to bed and remain there. It is foolhardy to get up and attempt to go about. Warmth is essential, and that can be secured by means of additional blankets and hot water bottles, if necessary. There is no danger in breathing cold air, so the windows must be kept open to ensure the entrance of fresh air. So the theory here seems to be that ventilation is the key to minimising the risk. There's also an element of encouraging self-isolation, as we would call it, if you had symptoms. What there doesn't seem to have been a great deal of concern about is that you might end up in hospital. If you did get the Spanish flu, uh, the chances are that you would end up staying in your own bed in your own home. So that's something. But it does lead on to another big question. How are you going to treat the symptoms of this flu? Are you going to get a relative or a neighbour to go to the chemist perhaps for something to ease your symptoms? That might not be as mad an idea as it sounds. Now we all know how the media is reporting what's going on in 2020. You'll have seen the regular announcements and the public health safety campaigns and the computerised graphs, our modern way of reporting. But back in 1918, one really striking thing about anything that appeared in the newspapers is that by reporting even the most mundane details about the flu victims, the editors, whether accidentally or deliberately, showed to their readers that every single flu victim was important. They were not just a number, a statistic, 
they were a person with a family. Sudden deaths from influenza. Last weekend, two sudden deaths from influenza occurred in Holsall Lane, Orton. In the first case, the victim, Mrs Sefton, wife of Thomas Sefton, died on Sunday, she carrying out her ordinary household duties on Friday. Miss Annie E Shaw, 16, daughter of Mr W Shaw, the second victim, was at work as a dressmaker's apprentice in the town on Saturday. Ormskirk veteran soldier's death. The death occurred on Monday from the effects of influenza of Gunnar Hugh Baxter of Derby Street, Ormskirk, an old soldier with 17 years service. The Lancashire BMD site tells us that the Hugh Baxter was 44 years old when he died. He was originally from Banks and in 1911 he was a traction engine driver. He lived at Shoreside in Hesketh Banks. With him was his wife of 17 years, Mary Ann, near Gregson. Annie Shaw was just a dressmaker's apprentice. Mrs Sefton was a housewife. But their deaths were considered just as worthy of notice as Hugh Baxter, who'd served in the forces, or indeed some of the notable people from the town, some of the important people who were also affected in varying degrees. Mr John Waring of Banks, a member of the Ormskirk Board of Guardians and West Lancashire Rural District Council, died as a result of pneumonia following influenza. His son, Mr Thomas Waring, died from pneumonia half an hour later. John Waring was 47, his son Thomas, 26. Mr T Colton, the chairman of the Ormskirk Board of Guardians, was absent from the October 1918 meeting due to having the flu. And then there's Mrs Rimmer. Mrs Rimmer, wife of Mr W Rimmer of the Talbot Hotel in Ormskirk, died on the 12th of November, the day after the armistice. In her case, she contracted flu and then developed what was called a sharp attack of pneumonia. A Skaysbrick family tragedy. The death occurred on Tuesday evening of Mr Joseph Hartley of the Skaysbrick Waterworks. Only last week his wife and daughter died, victims of the influenza. Mr Hartley's fatal illness starting with the same complaint. Three members of the family all dead from Spanish flu. In 1911, Joseph Hartley, the stoker of the waterworks, lived at the waterworks on Southport Road in Skaysbrick, and he'd been married to his wife Mary Ellen for 23 years. They had three young adult children, Lucy, Arthur and Alfred, all still at home with them. All were baptised at St Mark's Church in Skaysbrick. So I think that's quite a good point to bring in the case study put together by one of our members. now and then. The personal family history stories that we all try to research collide somehow with an event more widely known about in history in general. It is thanks to our member Stephen Hyten that I am able to tell you the story of Margaret Marshall. This is what Stephen has shared with me. Margaret was born in Holsall in 1887. She was the second of 12 children born to Robert Marshall, a farm bailiff, and Mary Ann Howard. And here we see her family tree. By 1891, the census shows that young Margaret was living at Birkdale Cop in Halsall. But that road actually crosses Boundary Brook, which literally does place it right on the boundary between Halsall and Southport. Her father employed three farm servants, including a John Hyten, aged 21, from Skaysbrick. By 1901, Robert, her father, was still employed as a farm bailiff. But now the family were living at Heathy Lane in Holsall. They hadn't actually moved very far if they'd moved at all. 
Essentially, a heathy lane is just a bit further down the same road as Birkdale Cop. It might actually be that it was still the same address and it has simply been interpreted differently by the census enumerator. This kind of thing could happen. So then when you move forward another 10 years, now aged 23, Margaret is still at home with her parents in 1911. And she and her sisters, Jane aged 19 and Anne aged 15, were engaged in dairy work. Her brothers James and Robert helped out on the farm and the younger siblings, Mary, John and Ellen, were still at school. In 1914, Margaret married William Hyten, the son of Henry and Elizabeth Hyten, at St Mark's Church in Skaysbrick. The 1911 census showed that William Hyten was working as a horseman for William Hooton at Hooton's farm in Skaysbrick. So again, it's all fairly local. But Margaret and William had one son, uh, Ernest, on the 4th of June 1917 again in Skaysbrook. And we can imagine that all three of them must have lived through the armistice of 11th of November 1918. But just a few months later, on the 18th of March 1919, William Hyten had to register a death. Earlier that day, Margaret had died, aged 31, at what we presume to be their home at Brown Edge. And two causes are given on the death certificate. She'd had influenza for nine days and pneumonia for four. That is quite a quick way to go. William had been present at his wife's death and so I'm sure that he would have agreed too with the modern view that the 1918-1919 flu and the symptoms that it caused did lead to a short, sharp, horrible death. He's 33 years old and he's already a widower with a 21-month-old baby. And it was his grandson, Stephen, who very kindly sent the pictures that follow showing the grave of Margaret Hyten and her husband William and his next wife, Sarah Jane, at St Mark's Church in Skaysbrick. William Hyten, Margaret's widower, did end up marrying again, apparently to Sarah Jane Ashton in 1930. William died in 1945, Sarah Jane lived on until 1986, and both were buried in the same plot as Margaret. So to round out this story a bit, I thought that I would check the details of the CD that our society made, with all the gravestone transcriptions on it, for St Mark's Church. And sure enough, I found Margaret and William and Sarah Jane's grave, which is numbered 5A17. In the same row, I also found a reference to three other people who have already been mentioned in this talk. A strange coincidence. Do you remember that obituary for Joseph Hartley from the Skagebrook Waterworks? Have a very close look at the following picture. The grave with the big white cross is Margaret, William and Sarah Jane Hyten's grave. The next stone to the left is where Joseph Hartley, aged 53, is buried. His wife Mary Ellen died on the 16th of November 1918, his daughter Lucy on the 17th and he himself died on the 26th. So aren't there some strange coincidences when you start to look into family history? As history judges it 102 years later, the Spanish flu came in three waves. There was a mild one in the spring of 1918. 
There was an absolutely catastrophic second wave in the autumn of 1918 and then there was a moderate wave in the spring of 1919. So it looks as though the Hartley family of Skatebrick were actually struck by the worst of it. Because on Monday the 11th of November everybody was celebrating the armistice. But Mary Ellen Hartley and her daughter didn't actually live on to see the following Monday. Maybe they were already feeling ill by the time the armistice was signed. And Margaret Hyten died during the more moderate wave of 1919. But even so, they were all individuals, they all had stories, and I hope that this talk has shown that these people, these millions of people who died, were not just numbers, not just statistics, they all had a story. They were all somebody's mother, sister, wife, auntie, whoever, they were all important to somebody. Because when we do talk about an outbreak of illness that becomes so widespread that we start to actually call it a pandemic, it becomes almost impossible to picture 50 million people dying and being buried, cremated. But it is as well to remember that they were all individual people, they all had friends and family who missed them and who would have been affected by losing them. Of course today in 2020 we have got technology that just wasn't around in 1918. We can do all sorts of sophisticated things, computerising statistics, pinpointing infection hotspots, we can get nice graphs up on the news. And not just for illnesses affecting humans either. Because nearly 20 years ago, cases of foot and mouth disease in animals were being tracked and traced and reported in pretty much exactly the same way as the situation in 2020 is. But the thing about family history, as we all know, is that it is all about people. And what really interests me is that they say history repeats itself. Well, by closing public buildings and schools and sanitising them and wearing masks in 2020 and trying to limit social gatherings, we only seem to be imitating what our ancestors did a hundred years ago. Well, one of the best things I think about putting this talk together is simply that the idea came from one of our members. You can't get any better input than that. If we've got members, we want to do things that cater for what the membership is interested in and I hope that this is some gesture towards that. So despite the sombre subject matter, I hope that this video has gone some way to remembering the stories and the lives of those people in West Lancashire who were affected by the Spanish flu. The ones I've talked about today are only a fraction of them. I'm sure many of you will have your own stories about relatives who were lost in the same pandemic. If anybody does have any ideas or suggestions or comments that they would like to make uh, in relation to that, then please do feel free to um, leave a comment on the video or get in touch with us via our website or Facebook or, or whichever other way you wish to communicate. Hopefully we will do at least one more of these talks before Christmas. Uh, what that subject or those subjects will be I have no idea yet. We will simply see how things go. In the meantime thank you very much for listening to this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it won't be long before I'm back with another one.